Hey guys, we're back with a recent trip recap and it was a day and a half. Really, really fun fishing. Um, daytime fishing, as you guys can see. And uh, we got on some long plunker style bites where the school stuck to us and we were able to drift for like almost two plus hours a couple times and uh, get our limit of bluefin. I love fly line for tuna. So what was uh, the line size that everybody was using? Uh, 40 pound was like kind of what everybody started on. Um, what was happening is we were pulling up to schools, um, find something on the sonar, throw some bait on it. It would boil up, charge the boat, and guys would get out there with their 40-pound fly line. And uh, we were hooking fish right off the get-go. We'd have five to seven fish hanging at a time. And uh, it kept on biting for a little while. Uh, were people throwing any like artificial stuff into the boils? Um, I think guys were throwing some Colt snipers and stuff like that. I don't know if we had much success on that during this particular trip. Um, almost everything was fly line. Um, we weren't even really using sinker rig, uh, because fly line was just hitting so good. You can see Alex is, uh, pointing out all the boils off the bow. <laughs> uh, yeah, the whole time we were stopped, they just kept on splashing around 360 degrees around the boat. You'd see fish boil react to a bait in the chum and, uh, guys were able to keep on plunking and picking at fish. And so casting out, uh, you know, in a fly line type of bite, right? So, Go to the corner, right? And the, I think a really easy indicator on which side you should throw out the bait. Just look at where the guy on the tank is throwing the bait out, right? You want to cast your line, cast your bait right where he's throwing that chum line. Yeah, the deckhands are uh, instructed to throw their bait and their chum line on the downwind side uh, because the boat's going to be drifting that way. So that keeps the school with you, um, throwing it on that side of the boat instead of letting the school walk away on the, the upwind side there. So what a lot of guys do is they will uh, get that fly line bait and cast it out right where the baits are landing from the deckhands. And they follow their fish around the corner all the way to the other side and get the wind in your face, which is uh, very important. And, you know, something people ask about all the time, right? It's like, how long should I soak my bait? Well, in my opinion, it really just depends on how the bite is, right? And even on the same school, sometimes I'm just going to leave my bait in, you know, up to like right where the gate is and get a new bait and recast. Sometimes, you know, when the bite has slowed down, I, you know, will take my bait all the way up to the bow. So that's kind of my opinion. What do you think? It all depends on the bite, like you said, and the bait. Um, sometimes I'll go through five, ten baits before I even start swimming a bait, really. Uh, when I go up to that bait tank, you know, I'm looking for the, the healthiest looking swimmer, um, a bait that I think is going to present really well to the fish that uh, is, doesn't have red on the belly, that has all its scales intact, uh, something that looks like it's going to swim really well. But sometimes you toss them out in the water and they swim right back towards the boat or they kind of get lazy in the water and you just feel like that's not the bait. Don't be afraid to change out your bait uh, and go through some bait and work at it. As my dad says, I need a new worm. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I mean, we tell people all the time, change your bait, change your luck. If your bait isn't swimming, it's not going to get bit. These fish just, they're very, very smart. They don't grow up because they're dumb. Um, even though these are like 25, 30 pound fish here, mostly the schoolies, they still are smart fish. They have really great eyesight. And it's a pretty beginner tip too, but it's really worth mentioning um, for people who don't know or haven't heard it before. But, you know, if you get a bait in your hand and then drop it on the deck, do not pick it up and use it. Just toss it over the side, throw it in the water, go grab a new fresh one. Um, additionally, you know, don't hook your bait in the bait tank and then wait for, you know, the boat to stop and then throw it in the water either. That's a, that's a pretty common one when uh, I tell people, there's a spot of fish up here. We see breaking fish, something like that. They'll run to the bait tank and they'll hook their bait too early and they'll run up to the bow even because that's where the fish are and they're just suffocating their bait fish. It's up there out of the water and it's just not going to swim good when it hits the water. Another key factor for guys is uh, not squeezing their bait to death. You got to be real gentle with the bait. Take care of it as you're hooking it. And uh, if you can get that hook in cleanly without squeezing your sardine to death, uh, let go of the bait grab the line and get it in the water as soon as you can. Taking care of that bait and getting in the water is going to be the key between getting bit or not getting bit. Right. I say minimal touches is super important to um, good bait care. And uh, during this drift, like I said, we started out with 40 pound and guys were getting bit pretty well. 
And uh, what was happening is the bite was slowing down, and we were still seeing fish boil up all around the boat, 360 degrees, and uh, the bite slowed down. So what guys did, the savvier anglers, they dropped down the 30-pound test, and they also dropped their hook size down a little bit. And then uh, we'd hook a few more. And then all of a sudden it stopped biting again. And a few guys dropped down to 25 pound test and an even smaller hook. And uh, they were able to get bit and continue to stop and keep on plunking. What was the range of hooks that guys were using? Uh, when guys were starting with 40 pound tests, a lot of them were using like a one aught or a size one hook, uh, depending on the brand. Right. And then uh, was when they dropped down to like 30 pound tests, uh, they were switching to maybe like a size two hook, something like that. And then when you drop down to 25 pound tests, some of the guys were dropping down to like a size four hook, which is a very small hook. And, uh, you know, what that does is the bait's going to swim through the water a little bit more naturally because it's pulling lighter line on a smaller reel. And, uh, that smaller hook is not going to show the fish and they're going to have an easier time. The sardine's going to have an easier time swimming with it. Another way that guys will sort of switch things up in order to try to get a bite if the bite is slow is, um, trying different uh, ways of hooking their bait. So, you know, the most common one is the nose hook. Um, I personally very rarely stray from the nose hook and, you know, especially in flight line bites, like I personally don't think it makes much of a difference, but some guys will swear by, you know, switching to the, uh, the collar hook or even the, uh, belly hook too. Definitely. A lot of guys believe in the belly butt hook. Um, what that does is the sardine's going to swim down a little bit deeper instead of staying up on the surface. Um, it's just its natural instinct when it's hooked that way. So um, instead of, you know, using a sliding sinker or a sinker rig, guys think, well, I'm going to butt hook my bait and uh, that's going to get it to the depth I want. And that works pretty well, actually. I've, I've seen success butt hooking baits for sure. Um but what also happens is the bait's going to die a little bit quicker mm -hmm. um, because of that hole there. And you will not get bit on the retrieve because your bait's going to pop off on the retrieve. Uh, nose hook is a little bit more user friendly for people that are just starting out for sure. Because there's like a defined area for people to, to put the hook in on the sardine. Uh, you'll see that little bit of cartilage and like in a triangle and a different coloration. And it's very easy to point out to first time anglers and especially with circle hooks that can be very difficult to put on um, the nose hooks a lot easier than a, a collar hook, for instance, that's going to take a little bit more finesse. Because if you go too deep with the collar hook, uh, you're just going to kill that bait and it's not going to swim very well. Yeah, the other two definitely takes more finessing, that's for sure. And so, you know, talking about going down line size um, and getting bit. So it's something that I've done multiple times. And even on the last trip I was on, I got ended up getting spooled um, because, you know, I was on lighter line and the bigger fish came through. So did that happen on this trip? Yeah, that's definitely something that uh, you need to be aware of. It can happen uh, just because you stop on a school of 25, 30, 35 pound fish doesn't mean that 50 60 70 pounders aren't lurking in that school and even if it's not in that same school um what will happen sometimes when you get a long bite is your school may move on and another school might find you that's in that area and you can get into these bigger fish and if you get caught with lighter line yeah you'll get spooled or you get chewed off or you don't know what's going to happen yep totally been there done that <laughs> but you know what it's fun to get a bite and it's fun to fight a fish you know as much as you can so um you know it's just the risk you take when you drop down in in line size definitely and what happens when you first start on a school you don't want to do that and drop down right away because if you get spooled right away chewed off right away and broke off right away right when a school gets on you you may not get the opportunity for this plunker bite uh, because those fish that you break off are going to swim away and they're going to pull off the majority of the fish. And it looks like Gunner here is a really good example. It looks like he got a little bit of a bigger model um, on some of his lighter lighter setups. Yeah, you can see here that uh, not as many guys at the rail. This was uh, towards the end of one of our really good stops and the fish stopped biting. They kept boiling around like we were saying. He dropped down to 25 pound test and uh, a small reel, light line. And he hooked into a larger model and he was on it for quite a while and he couldn't pull too hard. Yeah, that's the key, right? It's it's patience. Um, but also knowing that the longer you're fighting fish when you're undergunned like that, the greater of a chance you have of something going wrong, right? Right. That's why we uh, we suggest fluorocarbon, you know, 
Uh, I don't know if it gets bit better than mono or not. Some people think so, but the main reason that I like fluorocarbon is the abrasion resistance. And what's going to happen is you're going to turn that fish and he's going to turn different ways multiple times. And if he gets it so it chafes on his gill plate, his teeth, anything like that, it can rub off. Uh, your knot can break. Anything can happen on these longer fights. So that's why it's really tough to catch something that's double the line size like he caught here. This is like a 50 plus pound fish that he caught on 25 pound test. Yeah, it seems like overall it was a really solid trip for you guys. Like that steady bite is just, you know, makes for such a fun day of fishing. It really was. It was beautiful weather out there. Uh, steady fishing all day long. Guys hooking them up on fly line, getting all excited, working together, working the rail over, under, communicating. It was, it was a good time.